Hello from the Surgeons Club. Today we're going to talk about acute appendicitis. If you like our videos, please like and subscribe. Acute appendicitis is defined as severe inflammation of the appendix vermiformis. The incidence rate of acute appendicitis in Europe is 4 or 5 per thousand people. Acute appendicitis causes 75% of the acute abdomen syndrome. Appendicitis is most frequently seen in patients in their mid-twenties to late-forties and affects women twice as much as men. The three tenia coli converge at the junction of the tecum with the appendix and can be used to identify the appendix. The appendix can vary in length from less than 1 cm to 30 cm, but more often are 6 to 9 cm long. Appendicial absence, a duplication in the verticula have all been described. Acute appendicitis is known from the 16th century as peritophilitis. It's an inflammation evolving from the tecum causing death to the patient. In 1827, Myler describes the purulent iliac tumor as an inflammation of the appendix. In 1886, Fitz suggests appendectomy as a treatment. In 1889 was performed the first successful appendectomy by Sen. The greatest contributor to the advancement in the treatment of appendicitis was Charles McBurney. In 1889 he published his landmark paper in the New York State Medical Journal describing the indication of early laparotomy for the treatment of appendicitis. It is in this paper that he described the McBurney points as follows. Maximum tenderness. When one examines with the fingertips is, in adults, one or half two inches inside the right anterior spinal process of the ileum on a line drawn to the umbilicus. McBurney subsequently published a paper in 1894 describing the incision that bears his name. In our bodies, the appendix does not take place in digestion. It is now well recognized that the appendix is an immunological organ that actively participates in the secretion of immunoglobulins, particularly immunoglobulin A. There appears to be a negative age-related association between prior appendectomy and subsequent development of ulcerative colitis. Location of the appendix vermiformis is variable. Normal location is above the right iliopsoas muscle, but it can also be found in the ilioinguinal, retrotecal, pelvic, subhepatal, mesotecal, and retroperitoneal region. Etiology and pathogenesis. There are four main theories for the pathogenesis of appendicitis. Immune, lymphohematogenous theory for the enterogenic infection, and neurovascular theory. It is well known that diet rich in animal proteins predisposes intraluminal rotting and can cause acute appendicitis. Infection of the appendix occurs mainly from the lumen of the cecum. Appendix vermiformis is rich in lymphoid tissue and the hyperplasia of lymphoid follicles leads to the appendicostasis and cavity close. Acute appendicitis can also be caused by an obturation from foreign bodies, parasite and stercolize, and obturation from the outside. Some authors suggest a lymphohematogenous mechanism caused by a spasm or atonia. The initial abdominal pain without morphologic abnormalities can be explained with the lymphohematogenous theory. Presence of cavity close causes ischemia and necrosis leading to the infection of the appendix. Pathomorphologic classification Appendicitis catharalis it is swelled with hyperomia of blood vessels. Lymphoid follicles are swelled and mucose is permeated with left side infiltration. Appendicitis destructive. Uh, it is divided in two subtypes. The first one is phlegmonosa. It is infection spread in all layers of the walls and forms microabscesses. If the abscesses drain into the lumen, empyema of the appendix. The second subtype is gangrenosa. Appendicitis gangrenosa presents with two forms, perforativa and non-perforativa. A pendicular wall looks dark gray to black in color from the necrosis of the wall and thrombosis of blood vessels. There are several complications from appendicitis destructive. 
Periappendicular inflammation, it is a result of apical destructive process restricted by the omentum, uh, periappendicular abscess, it is progression of the periappendicular inflammation and can cause the formation of abscesses which can open into the abdominal cavity causing peritonitis and endotoxic shock. There are others such as retroperitoneal phlegmon, peritonitis, pilophlebitis or also called pielophlebitis and infected separated thrombosis of the portal vein. Clinical Presentation the clinical presentation of acute appendicitis is determined by the morphological changes and the location of the appendix. Abdominal pain is a constant symptom. Appendicular pain start, starts suddenly and is increasing in intensity. In children, appendicular pain encompasses the whole abdomen and continues several hours 6 to 10 before localizing in the iliocecal region. Usually, the pain starts from the epigastrium or the umbilicus and after several hours localizes in the iliocecal region. As a rule, appendicular pain does not irradiate. Appendicular pain usually starts at night or early in the morning due to the dominant parasympathetic function of the vagus nerve. Nausea and vomiting are symptoms of acute appendicitis and typically occur after the pain. The frequency of vomiting can be used as a prediction marker for the pathomorphologic form. Usually there is an absence of defecation in the same day of the clinical presentation, except for pelvic and retroperitoneal localization, which presents with tenasms. The tongue is dry and the body temperature rises to 38 degrees Celsius. The pulse increases accordingly to the temperature. Anorexia nearly always accompanies the appendicitis. It is so constant that the diagnosis should be questioned if the patient is not anorexic. Patients with, with appendicitis usually prefer to lie supine with the thighs, particularly the right one, drawn up. If asked to move, they do it slowly and with caution. Palpation is the main physical exam. Tenderness is often maximal at or near the McBurney, lens, or Kimmel points. Muscular resistance to palpation of the abdominal wall parallels the severity of the inflammatory process. Early in the disease, resistance, if present, consists mainly of voluntary guarding. As the peritoneal irritation progresses, muscle spasm increases and becomes largely involuntary. That is the true rigidity reflex due to the contraction of the muscles directly beneath the inflamed parietal peritoneum. Muscular resistance is also associated with skin hyperesthesia. Rectal examination can find swelled, fluctuating, painful to palpation mass. Laboratory findings. Lefkocytosis, ranging from 10,000 to 18,000, is usually present in patients with acute appendicitis and often is accompanied by a moderate polymorphonuclear predominance. Plain films of the abdomen, although frequently obtained as part of the general evaluation of a patient with acute appendicitis, rarely are helpful in diagnosing acute appendicitis. However, plain radiography can be of significant benefit in ruling out other pathology. Graded compression sonography has been suggested as an accurate way to establish the diagnosis of appendicitis. The technique is inexpensive, it can be performed rapidly, does not require a contrast medium, and can be used even in pregnant patients. Sonographically, the appendix is identified as a blind-ending, non-peristaltic bowel loop originating from the cecum. With maximal compression, the diameter of the appendix is measured in the anteroposterior di dimension. Scan results are considered positive if there is a visible non-compressible appendix around 6 mm in the anteroposterior direction. The presence of appendicolite establishes the diagnosis. Thickening of the appendiceal wall and the presence of periappendiceal fluid is highly suggestive. Sonographic demonstration of the normal appendix, which is an easily compressible, blind-ending tubular structure measuring 5 mm in diameter, excludes the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. The study results are considered inconclusive if the appendix is not visualized and there is no pericycle fluid or mass. High-resolution CT scans also have been used to diagnose appendicitis. On a CT scan, the inflamed appendix appears dilated, 
around 5 cm, with a thickened wall. There is usually evidence of inflammation with dirty fat, thickened mesoappendix and even as an obvious phlegmon. Treatment Despite the variety of different sophisticated diagnostic methods, the importance of early operative intervention should not be minimized. Once the decision to operate for presumed acute appendicitis has been made, the patient is prepared for the appendectomy. Adequate hydration should be ensured, electrolyte abnormalities should be corrected and pre-existing cardiac, pulmonary and renal conditions should be addressed. A lot of studies prove the efficiency of preoperative antibiotics in lowering the infectious complications in the postoperative period. Antibiotics are routinely administered to patients with suspected appendicitis. If catheroacute appendicitis is encountered, there is no benefit in extending the antibiotic coverage beyond 24 hours. But if there are complications, such as perforated or gangrenous appendicitis, antibiotics are continued until the patient is afibril and has a normal white blood cell count. For intra-abdominal infections of the gastrointestinal tract, the Surgical Infection Society has recommended single-agent therapy with cefoxidin, cefotidin, or tricortiline clavulanic acid. For more severe infections, single-agent therapy with carbapenems or combination therapy with a third-generation cephalosporine, monobactam or aminoglycoside plus anaerobic coverage with the clindamycin or metrondiazole is indicated. The recommendations are similar for children.